uh, benefits and some practical experiences, successful experiences uh, in early bilingualism or bilingualism. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm spanglishing a bit today. Um, so um, with us today, we have three, uh, three guests who are gonna talk about their personal experiences. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Isabel Quiroz, who is uh, from Colegio Hualén. Um, she is a coordinator, a coordinator an academic coordinator um, in English for uh, first to fourth uh, Pesico. Uh, we also have with us Ricardo Contreras, um, from Escuela Edmundo Vidal Cardenas in Vicuña, uh, who's on the program We Learn, uh, Fundación Oportunidad, and he is docente de Inglés y Jefe de Unidad Técnica Profesional. Um, I'm not sure if Billy's with us yet, but we will have Billy Forward, who is from the Universidad Chileno Britanico, and also uh, Vice Presidente, Vice President. Hi, Billy. You managed to join Hello. us. Hi, good afternoon. Um, from uh, uh, from uh, the Vice President Eatefel in Chile, his teacher trainer and support coordinator. So um, the session this afternoon, uh, I'm going to ask some questions to get us kicked off. And then the floor will be open to you, the participants. Uh, can I please ask you to uh, put any questions you have in the chat? And then when we finish the first round of questions, I will look at those questions and uh, ask questions on your behalf. Um, okay, so I hope everything is clear. Um, first of all, um, Isabel, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. And the question is, what lessons can be learned from successful bilingual education or schemes at a local level in Chile? Isabel. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone here. Um, well, first of all, on behalf of Wallen School here in Chile, I would like to thank Cambridge University Press, Ashnav, and the organization partners for this invitation to share my experience in early bilingual education with you. And I'm really honored to be here today. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to answer that question to, in, in order to share my reflections. Um, from a positive perspective and directly from the field. Everything I will share with you today has been a, a thought and worked for many years because I have been working with different schools in the last 10 years, transforming schools into bilingual schools. They were not born bilingual, although they have become bilingual. So it has been a huge, huge, a progress that we have done with those schools. Today I'm still on the field at Wallen School as an academic coordinator and teacher, which I'm very proud of that. So, well, I have been part of this process of change. So I have been a real witness in seeing and watching and being part of this uh, process, because I think bilingualism in our, in our experience has been a process that has taken at least six to seven years. We, our school runs uh, from bilingual education from first grade all through sixth grade uh, in this moment. So in order to tell you about my lessons, I can share some ideas with you. Um, the first one is that, well, I think we have to define first uh, what is what do we mean by bilingualism and success? Because I can tell you about successful programs and education, but what do we mean by that? There are many definitions out there, and but in short, for us, bilingualism we have defined it as the ability of a person to speak and communicate in two languages with a good level of competence in that second language. So the goal for our students is to learn content through a second language while along they are learning English. And success, well, I would say that success, we truly believe that schools that are successful are those uh, in which the students are really progressing. And most of the time we tend to criticize the system 
the approach, my approach today is a very positive and look for what, because people tend to look for what is not working. And my point of view today is very positive because I think it really works and it has been really successful, at least in our local region, because our students are progressing. Well, that being said, I can think of many, many <laughs> lessons I can share. But first of all, I think that one big lesson is that it, to become bilingual takes time, but it is possible and it works. So I think I challenge you if you're thinking on becoming bilingual or you're already bilingual and you, you kind of uh, are stuck on the idea that maybe it isn't working, it works. So I challenge you to continue with that idea. So, because when we decided to become bilingual, we planned this process and in stages. It doesn't happen overnight and in baby steps. A second lesson would be that bilingual education works, although no program is, uh, you can define it as universal. This was uh, hard to learn because since we were six schools, starting with a bilingual program about 10 or about yeah, eight years ago, we look for recipes and we came to the conclusion that that it's not that there's not such a thing like one size fits all why i think because of the context it is very important to consider the context the the because the program respond to local conditions and stakeholders so it's not i think that that is cr critical another lesson that well positive school and classroom climate should be a priority. I have seen that and it works because we underestimated the impact that this factor, the, the positive climate inside the school is a, cru is a crucial factor that has on students learning and achievements, especially in a bilingual context. We have come to the conclusion that teaching, especially in bilingual context, it's not about raising test. It's not just about raising test scores. It is much more than testing. So the positive climate, as well as other factors like parent involvement, faculty and administrators' commitment, raise our students' engagement and self confidence, which is crucial in a bilingual context. So because the students are not afraid of making mistakes and they feel supported. So that's has been very very successful for I mean. For our development. Another you, lesson. Um, Isabel, can I just um, interrupt yes. you there? Because um, and thank you for that. That leads very nicely into my next question, um, okay. which I'm going to direct at uh, Ricardo. Um, thank you, uh, Ricardo, for joining us today. So, um, Isabel just mentioned the, the, the learning context and the environment. So, to what extent does the immediate learning context of the students affect? final outcomes. Hey Greg, thanks for your question. But first of all, I would like to um, I would like to start by sharing a special word of thanks, a uh, word of gratitude to everyone which is in this audio. And because I consider that listening to different experiences, of course, inside and outside the classroom is important in order to help us as teachers or maybe coordinators or directors, right, to improve our own strategies, methodologies, and procedures, right? And now saying that, I would like to start answering your question. And I consider that when we talk uh, about learning context, we should not only focus on school or in the family, because we as teachers, we try to focus only in what we as teachers can do. And of course, some support from the family but also in the community where our students grow up, right? We are lucky, I'm talking right now about my own reality, we are lucky to live and teach in a touristic city. Maybe it is a small city here in Chile, which is Vicuña, right? But it represents the astro tourism capital of the world, right? So this um, this characteristic of my city where our students are learning English opens doors, but not only doors, but also windows that we are invited to, to get benefit from, right? And 
because it doesn't only benefit um, the tourism itself, but also our students, which is the most important at the end of the, of the day, right? So our students, as I mentioned before, they are not strange to the English language. They see every day, every more than every day, every year, hundreds and hundreds of tourists from all around the world. And of course, they communicate in English. This is the uh, worldwide language at all, right? And this is due to the wide range of sites and spots that you can do, that you can perform here in the city. This is um, uh, everything that I'm talking to you right now, to everyone here, is that is involving this small community, okay? Because um, at least it is not very common to see just in one city, in a small city, a wide variety of solar kitchens, windsurf, of course, astrophotography, hiking, horse riding, a museum dedicated to our Nobel Prize winner, which is Gabriel Mistral. So visitors from all around the world, they're invited to come to our small city. Right, but now we could be surrounded by infinity of activities like this in our city concerning the use of the English language. However, if schools are not willing to cooperate with this community, with the community or, the, or with the people that are involved with English speakers, this is going to be wasted. So um, eight years ago, we under understood this and we decided to switch we made a switch in our learning programs, our vision as well, right? So we moved to start teaching English, not just from the fifth graders, which here in Chile, they start, fifth graders are 10 or 11 years old, but we started with pre-elementary students. When they just start their education program, when they are four or five years old, we started to work with them with the English language, all right? So, and the results at the end of these eight years, the results don't lie because we applied a test, uh, an A2 level test in 2019 to sixth graders. So those were students that started in pre-elementary school, right? And we decided to take a test in order to check their um, reading, listening, speaking, and audio comprehension skills and 76%, if I'm not wrong, 76% of these students managed to acquire and to show us that they acquire an A1 level and the rest of them, they acquire an A2 level. So I, um, I fully agree with uh, my colleague, with, my, with teacher Isabel, right? That it is possible. It is possible, it takes time. You need to work with the family, with colleagues, but also with the community itself. So now we are moving forward in order to have our high school students, which are in um, A2 level, we are intending to move them into B1. And of course, when they are out of the system in a B2 level. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Um, I want to come back on a couple of points, but I'll ask a couple more questions, questions first. Um, Billy. Uh, thanks for joining us yes, this afternoon. Yes. Um, Thank you, Greg. Uh, question, uh, question for you. What are the benefits and challenges of implementing a bilingual program at the primary level? Um, I think one of the main benefits for, for starting with the primary level and starting as young as possible in reality, not necessarily just at primary level, but even before, is that that young children at that age are, are sponges for language. Like I have a two-year-old daughter and we're trying to raise her bilingually. And it, it, it's the way she absorbs language, both languages and recognizes that there are two words for the same thing really impresses me. And I think that's why you have to start early and the science shows you should start early with children because they develop languages a lot quicker when they're younger um, than they do as they get older, as they reach their teens, et cetera. And you also have this issue with bilingual education of the two factors, if it is the language being developed or is the language required. And when you're in the higher levels of bilingual education, you need the language in order to study at a bilingual school. Whereas if you start early, if you start with 
um, primary and they develop the language and they develop the skills as they progress, instead of being a requirement, it's about developing the language and developing the students to become the better bilingual learners. Another big advantage, and again, there's lots of science to back this up, is the way that it develops better cognitive skills in students. And, and science uh, tests have been done on this. I think it was in Canada. I'm not sure I'd have to, to remind myself, where they showed that bilingual students have longer attention spans. Bilingual students are able to, to think, um, what's the word? They are cognitively flexible, um, which means depending on the situation they're in, they can react to those situations and change the way they act, change the way they think better than people that don't come from bilingual schools or bilingual backgrounds. And um, they're also better at other things like problem solving. So I, I think the science really shows that a bilingual education from an early age can help students develop all of these important critical thinking skills. Now, going into the difficulties of a bilingual program, um, what both my colleagues, uh, Isabel and Ricardo have mentioned, is you need to have the support of all of the stakeholders, the whole school community. And this can sometimes be hard. Um, this can be hard because sometimes teachers find the extra workload difficult. Sometimes teachers don't feel they're prepared enough to teach the bilingual program. And sometimes it's hard to find a teacher to teach science who has the level of English. Sometimes it's hard to teach a, find a teacher to teach history who has the level of English. So these teachers that have those skills, they're, they're like gold dust. They're precious and when you get them, you have to try and keep them and keep them happy as well. And on top of that, you also have the other stakeholders like the parents, the school leaders, um, the directors, et cetera. And you have to keep those happy. And sometimes parents will blame their students under performance, not on, on what the student is doing, but on the fact that they're in a bilingual program, they don't understand the language well enough. So it's about convincing all of those stakeholders to be on the same team. And you're all working towards this one goal, this bilingual goal. And uh, for me, I think that's the main, the main difficulty. And, and I think it encompasses lots of things like you need to have good professional development. You need to meet with parents. You need to meet with teachers and convince them of your program and of your ideas if you want your bilingual program to be successful. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning that I wanted to thank CUP and ACHAP, ACHNAP for, for inviting me to be on the panel. I should have started with that, but okay, sorry. Okay, okay thanks, Billy. I should have also introduced myself at the beginning, and I didn't. Uh, for our audience, I'm Greg Holland. I'm the, the general manager of the British uh, Chilean Chamber of Commerce. So um, just so you know who's, who's on the panel. Um, Interesting, just a couple of points from that. I, I mean, I remember being at school a long time ago and um, in what we call secondary school, I guess, uh, uh, high school, and uh, being taught French. And I absolutely hated it. Um, and I could see no reason why I had to spend time when I could be doing something that I like, like maths or uh, playing sports or something. And, and actually, I didn't make a very good job of it. But then later in life, um, I realized as I was traveling around what an enormous benefit it would be. And then, of course, when I decided to move to Chile, I had to learn Spanish and uh, really regretted not having been a better student of languages when I was younger and also proved to myself that I can do it. But um, I mean, the point is, I think, and, and it's, it's what Ricardo mentioned, is that uh, the students there, they see so many visitors who are communicating in English that uh, there's, no, there's no sort of... Um, Confusion, there's a, there's a clear benefit to actually having the second language and being able to communicate with people. And I also think um, that the, the world has changed so much. Uh, Isabel, you mentioned, you know, the benefits of having a, a positive classroom and a positive learning environment and, and Billy, you know, having everybody, all the stakeholders involved. And I think that's a significant change over the last few years in terms of the level of uh, the quality of education that our children are getting, the, the realization of all these things to actually give them a uh, real um, an enthusiasm for, for learning a second language, in this case, in this case, English. So um, lots of really interesting, important points there. Um, Isabel, um, 
What makes a good teacher in bilingual education? What are the attributes of a good teacher? Well, actually, there's a lot. There, there are many, many qualities that a teacher should have. But in terms of a language, for instance, I think she should be a model of the target language of the second language and encourage the use of that language all the time in the school. I think that's crucial. Another thing is that, well, she has to be, she, I mean, I talk because of she, because I am a, a teach in Welen where the, we are only girls and teachers, women, but a, because they can, ex, a teacher, a good teacher in this bilingual context should have the ability to explain concepts to students in a way that they can easily understand. And for that, she needs to know uh, her students in order to make that content comprehensible. That's, that's also key. Another thing, I think that she needs to reflect on teaching, work collaboratively with all the other teachers as well. That's also important. Create opportunities for those students to practice the language and create this positive classroom with, without threatening the, the students in order for them to, to, to talk and to think in English all the time. Believe that all students can learn, I think is critical as well. So, so we need a teacher that believes that everyone is going to learn in that classroom. Um, according to organization, I think she needs to be good at planning, planning with other teachers, planning uh, to promote no threatening in, inside the classroom, um, to plan how to approach the material linguistically, and be, be very careful and intentional on that planning because she needs to, to teach in a very extremely complex context, to teach in a bilingual. Because for, for her, the challenge, the biggest challenge is to teach a content through another language, through, through a, a non-native language. And that is very important. She should celebrate success all the time and passionate about the language and the subject matter she's teaching, promote high expectations, provide many demonstrations, be very strategic on that, using visual gestures, role play, repetition of many uh, content and show empathy, be flexible, a good listener to the voice of the students and life, a lifelong learner. One of, one of the things, Isabel, that I've noticed since I've been in Chile is that lots of the people I've come across can actually speak some English, but they don't want to use it. There seems to be a lack of confidence so what can you do as an English teacher to inspire people not only to, to learn the language, but to have the confidence to use it? I think that the, the main thing is that she needs first to love what she's going to teach, love the language and feel very passionate about that. Because she, I think what I see in the schools, in the corridors and all the time with the small, especially with the small one, when you talk, talk all the time in English, and they feel your passion, you transmit that passion to the kids as well, and as well to the teachers. I, I, I see how I can transmit my enthusiasm uh, to the teachers as well. So they start, even the, the people that work in the school that is not teaching, uh, greet me in the morning and say, and say, good morning, Miss Isabel, all the time, because they tend to uh, look at me as, the the mod not the model but the um, uh, how can I say the they I, I am the symbol of English in the school and this is I, I am able to transmit it to the teachers and therefore to to the students so passion is the word okay. you don't run around with a track suit with a union jack on the back do you <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I um, just like to encourage our audience, Sam, there's a lot of you out there, there's a big audience this afternoon, I know it's getting late, but um, we have people from not only all around the continent, from Latin America, but we have some people from the UK and Europe, um, so please do ask some questions, do use the opportunity and the chat line um, to, or the chat box to ask us some questions, please. 
Um, Ricardo, um, how would you advise that directors and coordinators can ensure that teachers are sufficiently supported to afford sustainable bilingual learning, both inside and outside the classroom? Mm. You know, I have had the opportunity to work on different schools in Chile, not only here in um, at Vicuña, I mean in the Coquimbo region, but also in Nuble region, Bio Bio, and also in O'Higgins. And those, of course, are different regions in this long country. And in every school where I have taught English, I faced the same obstacle, and it was working isolated. Uh, from the rest of the subjects, that's what I mean. And though language, math, science, and history, they all seem to be working together according to the Ministry of Education in our country. Uh, but why can't English do the same with the rest of the subjects? So my first advice is to change or switch once again the mentality that English works alone, right? incorporate teachers of music, arts, physical education that are willing to speak in English. If we want, if we really want to ensure that students learn English for life and not just for a, for a mark, we need to expose them to more English than just 90 minutes in the classroom. We need to expose them to different subjects where our teachers are able to to use the language, of course. But now probably after I say this, uh, probably you're thinking, okay, stop. We cannot ditch, right? We cannot ditch our teachers to hire new ones just because they do not speak English, right? Probably this is something that most of the teachers, when I when I try to convince them, they they reply me with this, all right? And I understand, but here at my own reality in Mundo Vidal Cardenas School, the physical education teachers learn language thanks to a program paid by the public system funds, I mean, right? Uh, also, we also uh, incorporated more workshops or rather than incorporated more, we changed some of these workshops that students have during the afternoon. We forgot about the workshops that were with the standardized evaluation system here in Chile. And we started to include cooking, sports, and dancing, but with teachers who are willing to speak in English in order to motivate our students to use the language. And I would like to, to add something else. I had the chance to read the chat and I, and I gladly read one of the comments from Pasco Yao. And she mentioned something very, very important, which is um, the point is to look for and of course, be willing to accept support and to cooperate, to collaborate with the, with the rest. So we started to work with the with We Learn program, with the English Open Doors program, the teachers networks well, and cooperation with other educational communities. So as Paz mentioned, yes, she's, Truly right, cooperation is the key, right? Um, but not only have this network and look for help, we also need, we also need the space and time to assist, to allow our teachers to go and to innovate, to get experience, to get more knowledge from other teachers as well, right? And I would like to add, there are many facts, there are many strategies that we as teachers, we could include and, I, and of course, and I could say, but I would like to share probably the most important one the, and the final one, um, to expand the English speaking opportunities outside the classroom, as you mentioned, Greg, right? Allow students to share what they are learning, take them out of the classroom and create competitions such as the spelling bee for the little ones, the English week, what about the debates for the high school graders? We also, we could also prepare um, or more than prepare, commemorate some celebrations that are not common, probably not all of them here in Hispano America or Latin America, I mean, uh, like Halloween, Thanksgiving, uh, and also we are our school, believe it or not, we commemorate the 4th of July. 
It has nothing to do with our culture. It has nothing to do with Chile, but those are opportunities that we share and that we prepare and we plan in order to have our students to show what they are learning, to show uh, and share in English with the rest of the school and the school community. We are also inviting students from all other schools here in the community in order to share with us. And then before this pandemic scenario, we had our first summer camp, um, which was planned for our school. And we invited six different schools. So students from fifth and sixth grade, they had the chance to share with other students from other realities, from other socioeconomic contexts. And it was really, really great. So my last advice, my last piece of advice would be to expand the opportunities out of the classroom, not only in the classroom, but out of them and allow the students to share what they are learning. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. A couple of points there I, I almost find surprising. One I think is, is if you look at the richness of um, the music that comes out of the UK and the USA, uh, the arts and modern arts, the films and the, and the series that the kids tend to like, not the old fashioned arts, uh, the more classical stuff. A, a great deal of that is actually based in English. So it's, it's kind of surprising that there's not like this crossover between the, the subjects in the school, uh, where there's so much more to learn from outside perhaps than just looking looking locally. So, so that's a surprise to hear. Um, okay, Billy, um, what's your experience in Chile in terms of the typical challenges teachers in school seem to face in bilingual programs? Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges that, that's come up, and this kind of connects to Simon Lint's presentation and to, to the other presentations which were on CLIL, is the balance between content and language. And, and what teachers worry about is, is sometimes that the, the, the language is affecting the results of the content, or the other way around, the content is affecting the results of the language. And, and we actually did a training on this where, where I looked at the, the, the three school of thoughts with our schools and we discussed their opinion. But my opinion is that if you're going to do CLIL, if you're going to do content and language integrated learning, you have to integrate the two. If you separate them, if you start assessing them separately, it's not going to work as effectively as it could. Um, so, so we spoke about how you can create a rubric which includes the language of assessing language as well as the language of assessing content. So this is the content and this is how we want the language to produce the content and it's one part of the rubric. Um, so we discussed the integrating of the two because what teachers worry about is that they're not going to learn the content as well if they're teaching it in um, the second language. Um, another issue that, that teachers constantly talk about and, and I, in my area as being in charge of professional development for the Cambridge schools, this is important, is that they, they feel they need more opportunities for professional development, more help developing the skills they need in the classrooms, which Ricardo mentioned is important as well, that, that you give teachers workshops, that you give them the skills to, to implement the, the bilingual program um, successfully. And finally, which is related to what both Isabel and Ricardo have been talking about as well, is motivation. Um, they, sometimes the students aren't motivated, particularly when they're being taught in the L2. So what you have to do is you have to find the, the intrinsic motivation of the students. Um, and again, something that, that Simon Lint mentioned is, is doing a needs analysis of your student, finding the interest, the way your students like to learn, and adapting your classes, adapting the course book to get that motivation from the students. Um, and, and again, as, as Ricardo mentioned, doing things outside of the classroom. I mean, at the moment, coming up to the, to the Cambridge schools, we have a, a science fair. Um, and this is a science fair where they can pr produce their own projects and it has to be a science project they can do at home. But it's something fun, something for them to use English with. Um, and, and it's not high pressure. So I, I think those are the keys to, those are the key issues that the that, that teachers mentioned. Um, they, they don't feel prepared enough that they have enough training, that they worry about the balance between content and language, 
and that they don't feel the students are motivated enough. So those are the three, three key aspects for me. Okay, thank you, Billy. One of the, um, one of the things that I've been trying to understand as, you, as you've been talking um, is just when is the right time to actually start introducing bilingual education in, in the schools? And uh, we've talked from you know, quite a few um, comments from different age groups. So is it ever too early to start? Um, that's an open question. I would say no. <laughs> okay. Again, this is this is my experience with my daughter. Watching her grow bilingually is, is amazing. And and like she she code switches already. She has she's two years old and she code switches like and so when she talks to my wife, she speaks in Spanish. When she talks to me, she speaks in English. And sometimes she'll try both languages if she doesn't get what she wants. Okay. So the other day she had an ice cream, which is not usually allowed, and she wanted another one. And she said to me, mass. And I'm like, no, no mass. And she said, mass. And I said, no mass. She goes, more, more. <laughs> so I, I think the earlier you can is, is the best time to start a bilingual education for me. Um, because like I say, student, uh, children are sponges and they'll pick up the language um, uh, very quickly so that's my especially opinion. I, I would add I would add to Billy uh, that I'm absolutely with you in that sense and I have seen that in our context which is in, I insist we transform our schools into bilingual education and what I have seen along the years is that the earlier you begin the earlier the, the better because they start thinking in English and that that's bilingualism when you don't know which is a language you're, you're, you're not translating, in other words. So they start talking about a uh, pasame de pencil. So that <laughs> they are in that process of thinking in the, in the target language. And that's huge. And that, the, the earlier you become, I mean, the earlier you learn it, the, the better for that, for that brain to develop. And, and, and I just I'm going to add another thing related to ongoing teaching professional development. I think uh, what has worked for us is that we we have tried to um, to train our teachers, which is a very it's a, it's a huge problem we have all over the world, uh, how to train and when to train. And we have discovered that the ongoing teacher professional development along the year, it's better than to give this bunch of workshops at the beginning of the year where everybody is running out of time. So what we have tried and it has been successful is to work with the teachers, a small group of teachers, training them during the year in different aspects. Thank you, Isabel. Ricardo, do you have any uh, further comment on that? You mentioned, I think, of the importance um, of having all stakeholders on board um, how do you how do you involve the uh, the parents? How enthusiastic are the parents to get their, their the children learning English in school? Yes, very good question. And I will I would answer this question by coming back to one of my previous arguments that I mentioned that also Billy mentioned as well that exposing our students to outside opportunities and these opportunities are should not all, should not only be in in the in the school and with closed doors we should open the doors invite the parents invite the community and allow them to see what their kids are learning most of the students when they are more grown up we take those students into the park i mean in the plaza in at Vicuña and they start looking for tourists in order to establish a conversation with them. We force them to talk with them. And we had a few years ago, we had the access program and we took with the, with the teachers, we took the students to the center of the town, to downtown in order to look for some tourists in order to put in practice what they are learning during the class. So I would say that um, this opportunity is outside the classroom and inviting the parents to see what they, their kids are learning are especially involving in order to get them 
the motivation that they need, and of course, the support that the school need to keep improving in their learning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Well, I'm, uh, I'm monitoring the chat, and um, we have a lot of congratulations, and we have a lot of agreement. Um, uh, so, but I don't see any more questions. So I think it's probably a good time to, to halt the, uh, the, um, the panel there. We've got a lot of information. Um, and on behalf of uh, Cambridge University Press, or ACHNAP and the University of Edinburgh, and also the uh, British Chamber of Commerce, uh, thank you very much to our panelists, uh, to Billy, Ricardo, and Isabel for your valuable contributions and interesting, uh, in interesting perspective. Also, thank you to everybody who joined the panel discussion this afternoon. And just a reminder to check your agenda. Uh, the, uh, the event continues to tomorrow, so have a look at the agenda and make sure you get into the uh, bits that you really want to listen to. But with that, thanks very much for attending. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the day tomorrow and uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. And good luck to everyone. Same to you, you Isabel. It was a pleasure. It, a pleasure was mine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you, Greg. Pleasure.